We are here and we are studying the book of Revelation because there is a rumor going around. There are those who are saying that the book of Revelation is hard to understand. But O oh, contraire, say we, for you see, the word revelation itself means that something has been revealed. revealed. Absolutely. If God wanted to conceal something, he would have called it the concealation, not the revelation. And what is it that's revealed in this book? Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the opening line, says it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And what we'll find is that Jesus is revealed in this book, not as he was 2,000 years ago, but as he is now in his eternal glorified state, we might say. So God so wanted his people to read this book that he promised that for those who take the time to read this book, they would receive a very special blessing, and that blessing is found in Revelation chapter, one, verse, three. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Let's look at it. Blessed is he who reads. It's the only book of the Bible that says this. And those who hear the words of the prophecy. Now, one of the things that I do want to point out important today, it says the words of the prophecy. It's not prophecies. It's not a, a, a collection of prophecies. It's one prophecy, the whole book uh, of the prophecy. And heed the things which are written it for the time is near. So it would be hard for us to believe in a God who would say, I'll bless you if you read it. I want you to hear it. I want you to heed it. But here's the thing. You'll never understand it. It'd be hard for us to believe in a God like that. But God knew that there'd be those going around saying that the book of Revelation is hard to understand. So to make sure that we understand this book, God placed in this book its very own outline, which is found in Revelation chapter verse Revelation chapter 1, 19. This is the only book of the Bible that comes with its own outline. John is told, therefore, write the things which you have seen. That'll be the first division. And the things which are, that will be the second division. And the things which will take place after these things. Three divisions in the book of Revelation. So John is told, write the things that you have seen. So the question is, what has John seen up to this point? Well, verse 13, it tells us, and in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man. And it goes on to give this incredible description of Jesus as we would encounter him now. But then it says, write the things which are. Now, the things which are will pertain to the time period that you and I would call the church age. Church age. And that will be found in Revelation chapters two. two. Who said Three over there. <laughs> chapters two and three. Revelation chapter two and three. Jesus dictates seven letters to seven churches. These churches literally existed. What he writes about literally took place. But what we find is because it's a prophecy, one prophecy, that these churches in their order laid out 2,000 years of church history with incredible precision. And if you were here, you'll remember we brought out the church history books and we just kind of walked right through. Lays out 2,000 years of church history with incredible precision. If you reverse the order of any of the churches, it makes absolutely no sense. But in their order, they lay out 2,000 years of church history. But then he says, write the things which will take place after these things. Well, after what things? Well, after chapters two and three, the church age. So the next time we will find that phrase, after these things, will be in Revelation chapter four, four verse one. Chapter four, verse one. Let's look at it. Everybody turn to chapter four, verse one. And it says, after these things. If you haven't underlined that, you'll certainly want to. I looked and behold, John says, a door standing open in heaven. The first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place. It's not gonna change after these things. And so the Holy Spirit is so concerned to make sure that we don't miss that this is the third division in Revelation, that he begins the verse with the phrase, after these things, and he ends the verse with the phrase, after these things. And this is, as we've said so many times before, a picture of what we call the rapture of the church. John sees a door open in heaven, a voice like a trumpet. The voice says, come up here. And immediately, John is in the spirit in heaven. And as we went through chapters four and five, we saw that the entire church is there in heaven around the throne. So the church goes up, chapter four. And one of the things that we noticed is that when the church goes up, chapter four, verse one, although the word church will be mentioned over 20 times in the first three chapters, 
we find that from chapter four, verse one, to the end of the book, there's gonna be one word that's gonna be glaringly absent, and that word is church. church. And the reason being is that the church is no longer here on the ground as part of the story. The church is in heaven. And uh, it, we will see the word church after the story in the closing remarks. We'll talk about that today. So the church goes up, chapter four, verse one, and then what comes down? Wrath. Wrath. And that is found in Revelation chapter six. verse 16. 16. Let's look at it. Everybody turn to chapter six, 16. Chapter six begins that seven-year period known as the tribulation. It begins in chapter six, verse one. We point to ch- verse 16 just for illumination. And it says, they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne, a reference to God the Father, and from the wrath of the Lamb. And in the Bible, the Lamb is always a reference to, always a reference to Jesus, and they are surprised that there came a point where God poured out his wrath on the earth. Many people are uncomfortable with God pouring out his wrath. Always remember, before verse 16, there's verse nine. Let's look at verse nine. Now, this is in heaven, and it says, when the lamb, Jesus, broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain. They had been killed because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And so here, God has been giving grace and mercy and invitation, but they're doing terrible things to his children. Just as you are passionate about your children, God is passionate about his children. And so there comes a point when God says, enough. Well, I want you to turn all the way to chapter 19. Uh, We've traveled through this seven-year period known as the tribulation. That's from chapter 6 all the way through chapter 18. And then in chapter 19, we had what was called the second coming of Christ. Jesus comes back, and in verse 11, many of you will have a title there in your Bible. It will say, the coming of Christ, the second coming, however your Bible says it. But uh, that begins in verse 11. I'll just read verse 11. It says, and I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on it was called faithful and true, speaking of Jesus, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. And we went through that. It talks about Jesus coming back. Jesus comes back in chapter 19. Then in chapter 20, everybody turn to chapter 20. He sets up his kingdom on the earth. It's called the millennial reign. It's for a thousand years. If you were here, we underline thousand years each and every time we saw it. I'll just read verse six, chapter 20. It says, blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for how long? Thousand years. You wanna underline that. And he keeps saying a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years to make sure that we understand that he's not speaking spiritually or metaphorically, but he really means it's a thousand years and he's gonna set the kingdom up for a thousand years. It was after that thousand year time period where God says, okay, I'm done with this earth. I'm done with this, this heaven as we, we know it now. And uh, eternity began. So in chapter 21, verse one, it said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And we looked at that last week when God's done with this and uh, he begins a a brand new. He, 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 He creates a brand new heaven and earth. And in verse 10 of chapter 21, it says, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God not coming down to the earth, but coming down to where John is. And so there's the city, the holy city, or or the the new Jerusalem, we would say. And in verse 16, it gave some dimensions which are important. Again, this is in eternity, but I put verse 16 on your outline because it gives, gives it in language that we would understand. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as its width, and he measured the city with the rod 1,500 miles. I've underlined that. That's gonna be important for our study today. Its length and width and height are equal. And we talked about how that would be incredible for John, who grew up in Israel, where the average city or village was somewhere between three to five acres. So to see this city that's 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles uh, is, is gonna be absolutely incredible. So everybody turn to chapter 22. 
We're going to take a few verses and look inside of this new Jerusalem, and, um, and then we're going to ask a question. And the question is this. If you were God and you were writing the book of Revelation, what would be the one point that you would drive home one last time uh, in this book? And we'll see that today as we go. So um, chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. Uh, Again, this is in eternity. This is that new Jerusalem. And he says, then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal coming down from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of the street, on either side, the river was the tree of life. And and either side of the river was the tree of life. Bearing 12 kinds of fruit, I've underlined fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and I've underlined that, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and I've underlined that, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So as we get into this today, once again, I have to say that there's so much more going on here that we could talk about in, in, uh, in, in the time that we have. So I want to give you enough that you go through and you go, okay, I, I, I get it, I get the big picture, and it, it makes sense, but there's a lot, lot more. So you have this city of Jerusalem, we're told, New Jerusalem there in heaven, and the city is 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles according to our measurements. You notice in verse one, it talked about a river of the water of life, clear as crystal coming down from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And uh, it could very well be that this river could be over 1,000 miles long as it comes down from the throne. We don't have the dimensions or or, or how long it is, but it could be over a thousand miles. And then we also saw in verse two, it says on, in the middle of its street on either side of the river was the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit. And hopefully you've underlined that. When it says that it bears 12 kinds of fruit, it answers the big question on every guy's mind, which is, is there food in heaven? <laughs> Apparently, yes. One of the things that I find interesting when you go through the Gospels, when Jesus is raised from the dead and he appears to his apostles, for instance, in Luke 24, it's not on your outline, but he appears to his apostles and the first question he asks is, do you have anything to eat? And they give him broiled fish. And In John 21, uh, he's the disciples, he's been raised from the dead. The disciples go fishing. Uh, the, Jesus says, have you caught anything? They say, no, we haven't. He says, cast it on the other side. They realize it's the Lord. Peter jumps in the water. And it says, as he gets there, he realizes, they realize that there's Jesus and he's cooking fish on a fire. So apparently there's food in heaven. So hopefully that's good news. I don't know that we need it, but it's there if we want it. So, well, verse two, it says, In the middle of its street on either side of the river was the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. Now, when it says month, it implies, and you want to write this down, that there's a form of time in heaven. There's a form of time in heaven. Everything doesn't just happen at once. We are going to heaven. We are not going to nirvana. In nirvana, you're kind of absorbed into the collective consciousness, but In heaven, you retain your identity. It's still you. You're not absorbed into anything. But then the last line of verse 2, it says that the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, the word there, I put this there in your outline, says the healing of the nations. Healing there in the Greek is the word therapia. Does everybody see that? So we would get our English word therapy. Now, in our language, when we think of therapy, we think of this ongoing process where we're getting better. Uh, That's not the way that the word was used in the original language. Their therapy just means good for you. It's just good for you. So uh, it's not that you need it, but it's there and, and it's good for you. But then it says the therapy or the healing of the nations. And what I love about that is the word there for nations is ethnos, ethnos. And uh, if you were to translate this 500 years ago, you might use the word nations as you translated it, but, but the better translation would be people groups because the word there is just ethnos. 
And what it means is that in heaven, we retain our ethnicity. And last week, we talked about the things that we tend to divide over in this life and in our world will be the things that we celebrate when we get to heaven. So we retain that. Well, verses three through five, it says there, was no, there, will, be, or there will no longer be any curse. And I've underlined any curse. And the throne of God and the lamb will be in it and his bondservants will serve him. Now, my translation says serve him. How many of your Bibles say worship him? Yeah, that's good. I actually like the worship him better. It's a, a better translation, but serve or worship either way. And they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and there will no longer be any, any night and they will not have need of the light of the lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them and very important, it says they will reign, you want to underline that, forever and ever, forever and ever. It says there will no longer be any curse. Now, in the Bible, the curse was death. When we were created, we were not created to die. When you, you go to school and you take a science class or something like that, they'll tell you, that our bodies are miraculous in the sense that our cells are constantly being renewed. Some will say that every seven years, all of our cells are renewed and we're brand new. Have you ever heard anything like this? So our cells are constantly being renewed. But have you noticed that our cells are being renewed, we're becoming brand new, but we look seven years older? And, and, uh, so we're being renewed every seven years. And as I, I like to say, as we get older, even though we're being renewed, it used to be that I had to do something for my body to hurt. Now, all I have to do is wake up and get out of bed. Am I alone in this? Anybody? <laughs> yeah. It's, and, and so we're being renewed every seven years. But you notice that even though we're being renewed, we're older and older and older. So when we get 85, 95, or if we hit 100, we're brand new, but then we die. Why? Well, death is a mystery. Death is a mystery because we were designed to be perpetually renewing. But sin entered in, and when sin entered in, that began death. So yes, we're still renewing, but we still die. Does that make sense? That, that ends in this lifetime, not in the next lifetime. But then... At the end of verse five, it says, they will reign forever, forever and ever. That word reign there, basaliuo, means to be king. I put the definition on your outline, to exercise kingly power to reign. So when, when you think of heaven, uh, now I've written down a couple of words and, and uh, I'll throw some words out. You can fill out whatever words you want, but to reign means there's gonna be activity, there's gonna be purpose, there's gonna be administration. I've written down some other words to reign uh, like a king uh, is going to involve leadership. It's going to involve decision-making. It's going to involve progress. And so what he wants to drive home is that when you go to heaven, you, there's something that you're going to be doing. You're going to be reigning. You're gonna to have to make decisions and moving forward, you're gonna be over something. Nowhere in your Bible does it say that you're gonna be sitting on a cloud playing a harp. That viewpoint comes from somebody who doesn't want you to go to heaven. And they will tell you that all your friends are gonna be in some other place. And you wanna go have fun, and, and that's not what that other place is like. And so he wants to communicate, lie to you, that it's all gonna be about sitting on a cloud playing a harp. Does anybody get excited about sitting on a cloud playing a harp? Nobody does. But, but the idea is that in heaven, you will be reigning. You're gonna be over something, decisions, creating. It, it's gonna be a, a place of activity. So you wanna, you wanna know that. Well, verse five ends the description of heaven. And the story of, of uh, Revelation is over, but then there's these closing thoughts that God wants to give. Now, as we get into the closing thoughts, once again, let me ask, if you were God and you had the opportunity to take a you know, portion of a chapter and drive home one point, what would that one point be? Well, we're gonna see that as we go. So we're gonna pick it up in verse six, and it says, and he said to me, 
These words are faithful and true. You want to underline that? And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants, that's you and me, the things which must soon take place. When he ends the description of heaven and he begins the closing thoughts, the first thing that he says is that these words are faithful and true. What he is saying is in the first 21 chapters, the first five verses of chapter 22, everything that he has said, if it seems impossible, indescribable, improbable, you know, hard to fathom, he says, I want you to know that these words are faithful and true. It is going to happen just as he has said. You can take it to the bank. Well, verse seven, he goes on, and I put verse seven on your outline and also in your Bible, you wanna read it. It says, and I'll read it in the Bible, then on the outline. He says, and behold, I am coming quickly. This will be the first time he tells us this. Blessed is he who heeds. Pay attention to the word blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. You wanna underline this book. I put that verse on your outline. He says, behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy. Once again, this is a single prophecy, the entire book of Revelation of this book. So a couple of things as we get into this. He says, I'm coming quickly. Now, what does that mean? Well, that word in the original language is taku. It can mean shortly, without delay, soon. I've underlined by surprise or suddenly, suddenly or quickly. And I, I believe that the emphasis is going to be he arrives suddenly. But then you notice, once again, it says, behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed or blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. You'll remember in chapter one, he says, blessed is he who reads. Here he says, blessed is he who heeds. You have to read it before you can heed it. Does that make sense? But, but here, here's the point that I, I, I want you to get, and you wanna write this down. Revelation begins and ends with blessing. It begins and ends with blessing. He wants us to know this book. And then, at the very last part of verse seven, very important for our study, behold, I'm coming quickly, blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Does your Bible say this book? So what I want you to do is you, you wanna underline this book and then you wanna write a little number one next to where it says this book. Because what we're going to find, I put this on your outline, this book, Revelation, uh, is going to be emphasized seven times in this chapter. He's gonna point us back to this book. Now before we do that, two two verses that I just think are so fun, verses eight and nine. He says, now I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down. And I, you underline this just for fun. Worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Quick quiz, worshiping an angel in the Bible. Good thing, bad thing? Bad thing. Okay, verse nine. But he said to me, the angel, do not do that. I'm, I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and the prophets, uh, and those who heed the words of this book, you wanna underline this book and write a little number two next to this book, worship God. I love that, that this takes place because this helps me and hopefully it, it, it helps you. Have you ever done something and um, you know you shouldn't have done it and you thought by this time in your spiritual walk you would have been done doing something like that, and, and maybe you've, you've done it before, and now you've done it again, and, and you thought, why am I still doing the same stupid thing? Am I the only one? Okay, so what I love about this is here's John, and he's filled with the Spirit. Chapter four tells us he's literally in the Spirit. He's an apostle of God, and he misses it, and he worships an angel. Not only that, but he did the same thing back in chapter 19. We went through that back in chapter 19. Now, should John have bowed down and worshiped an angel? Take a guess. 
No, okay. Um, so he's done that before. Is he still saved? Okay. Does God still love him? Is he still an apostle? Does God hold it against him? Do you think that God knew that he was going to do this even from the foundation of the world? Okay. Um, is God surprised that John has done this? So will God still use him and bless him? Okay. Um, worshiping the wrong person in the Bible is a very big thing. But what I love about this is as we read this, there's no verse that says, and clouds appeared in the heavens, and lightning and thunder, and a finger came out and pointed at John, and a voice like thunder said to John, 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 you're such an idiot. <laughs> that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. So, so here, here's what I hope that you and I can walk away with. John doesn't want to do the wrong thing, but he finds himself once again doing that same stupid thing that he did back in chapter 19. And I'm convinced, I'm convinced, if Revelation went on for 10 more chapters, he'd do the same stupid thing again. God knew, God doesn't hold it against him, he's still an apostle, and it's the same thing for you and I. There are some of those things we don't want to do. We, we think, I'm so far beyond that. But in those times that we blow it, now don't run to it, but in the times that you blow it, just know that he still loves you. He doesn't hold it against you. You're still his. He can still use you. So don't let the enemy come in and be the accuser of the brethren saying that God can't, can't use you anymore. Make sense? Okay. Well, again, verse nine, you want to underline this book and put a number two there. Then verse 10 is the final message, and it says, and he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. And you want to write a little number three right there, for the time is near. I put that there in your outline. He said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, Revelation, uh, for the time is near. So whatever you do, don't seal it up. So that word seal, I won't try to pronounce it, but there in your outline, it means to hide, to keep in silence, or to keep secret. So, so far in our chapter, we've been told there's a blessing if we heed it, and whatever you do, don't seal up this book. No other book of the Bible says, don't seal up this book. It's not like you come to the end of the Gospel of Luke, and there's a verse that says, Whatever you do, don't seal up this book. It's only found here in the book of Revelation. So, so why is it that God feels in the closing remarks that he has to say, whatever you do, don't seal up this book. Don't seal up this book. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to suggest to you that there's somebody who wants us to know this book, but there's somebody who wants us to not know this book. And so he says, don't seal it up. So the question is, how do we seal up this book? Well, I, I, I think, I think that the way that this book is sealed up for God's people is that we go to church and we're told, don't read the book of Revelation. It's hard to understand. Don't focus in on that. There's so much more that you can look at. It all pans out in the end. I mean, after all, we win in the end. So don't worry about the book of Revelation. Uh, have you ever heard anything like that? Yeah. So, so let, me, let, me, let me say this be, before um, we go any further. Many of us come from a tradition where we were told that. Don't go back and be mad at your last pastor, your last church, if they sealed up, didn't, didn't tell you about this. They don't know. They don't know. I went to seminary. There was no, there was no class on Revelation. We were told, don't worry about that. It, it doesn't matter. So, so the idea is that they're not being evil, they just don't know. They don't know, so don't bash them and, and we certainly don't wanna do that. But here's what he says, whatever you do, don't keep this book a secret. Make sense so far? Okay, well, uh, verse 10, he says, for the time is near, and I put that on your outline, that the word there is kairos when it says the time is near. There's two words typically, I don't know if I put this on your outline, but in the Greek they'll use the word kairos akronos. The word here is not chronos. Chronos means a chronology, 
Kairos means more of an opportunity, and I put that there in your outline. Kairos means an occasion, a proper time, an opportunity. So God has given us this opportunity, and he wants us to know this. Verse 11, he says, let the one who does wrong still do wrong. The one who is filthy still be filthy. I keep thinking about my kids' bedrooms at home, but this is not... <laughs> And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy keep himself holy. And the idea is that whatever state you enter into eternity, whatever state your soul, your spirit enters into eternity, that's your state for all eternity. Well, verse 12, he says, behold, I am coming quickly. And that's the second time. And he says, and my reward, underline the word reward, is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. Now keep in mind, everybody in this chapter, if they're there, they're believers. They're believers. So he's not speaking here. He's already dealt with those who are hostile. And he says, I'm coming with my reward. He's not saying, I'm coming with salvation. So you want to write this down. Salvation is a gift. It's a gift. Our salvation is a given, but our reward is, 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 a reward is very different than salvation. Reward is based upon something that, that we've done here. So in last week, uh, we looked at a verse. I'm gonna read it again this week from Luke. Jesus gave the example, and he says, well done, my good servant, there in your outline, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of 10 cities. So the idea is you've been faithful here, Here's your reward, and your reward is much greater. So here, the reward that Jesus is bringing to those of us who are in this place is going to be much greater, but it's, it's not salvation, that's, that's a given. So it's based upon what we've done here. So write this down. The future reward is based upon our current faithfulness, our current faithfulness, our current faithfulness being his servant. In church world today, there is this mindset where we go to Jesus and we say, Jesus, I want you to come alongside of me to help me accomplish my goals, my dreams, my desires. And in essence, what we do is we make Jesus our servant as he empowers us to do what we want. There's no reward for that. And certainly Jesus wants to see us do great things. The reward comes from us being his servant and accomplishing what it is that he has for us. And uh, apparently that reward is much greater than anything we could imagine. Well, verses 13 and 14, he says, I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those, some of your Bibles will say it a little bit differently, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to eat of the tree of life and may enter the gates, enter by the gates. Now, your Bible is going to say something like into. Does your Bible say into or something like that? So you wanna underline that into the city. Of course, that's going to be that new Jerusalem. Just very quickly, uh, verse 14 can be translated two different ways. Blessed are those who wash their robes, and it can also be translated, blessed are they that do his commandments. So here in verse 14, you have those who are going into the city, and that's the new Jerusalem. But notice verse 15, my translation begins with the word outside. Does your Bible begin with outside? So you want to underline that. So you have the inside going into versus outside. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. So the idea is here you're either going into the city or you are outside. There is no third compartment. It's either in the city or outside is the point that he's making. Now, he says dogs. They didn't think of dogs as we, thought, as we think of dogs today. Dogs were not pets 2,000 years ago. They were scavengers. Uh, you never wanted to run into a pack of dogs because they'd tear you up is the, is the idea. So all those who are evil and those scavengers and those who tear you up are on the outside. So you're either on the inside or the outside. Verse 16, he says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. Underline that. 
Now, how many of your Bibles say something like in the churches? Okay, I'm, however your Bible says it, for the churches are in the churches. Underline that. I am the root that is on the beginning and the descendant, offspring of David, the bright and morning star. The bright and morning star. In the Bible, if you've been around the church, you know this, that you have this king in ancient Israel. His name was David. David was promised that it would be one of his offspring who would become the Messiah, the, the Christ. But he's not just the offspring, he's the one who was before David. He's existed for all eternity. So Jesus says, I'm that one there. In your Bibles, though, it will say, I've given this to testify for the churches or in the churches, however your Bible says it. But um, early on, in the, we, we would say, that the word church never appears in the story after chapter four, verse one. But in the closing remarks, the word church appears here. And what Jesus is saying is after the story, I've given this to testify in the churches, for the churches. The idea is that he says, I want you in the churches to know this. I want you to know this. So he says, I don't seal it up. There's a blessing for those who heed it and I've given this for the churches or to be a testimony in the churches. He wants all churches to know this. So the idea is you don't wanna, you don't wanna seal this up. Sadly, the book that he tells us, whatever you do, don't seal up, is the book that's sealed up the most. And uh, so, anyways, verse 17. The spirit and the bride, the bride is the church, the spirit and the bride say, come. This is the invitation. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes, some of your Bibles will say whosoever wishes, either way, take the water of life without cost. So I've testified, I've given this to the church to be a testimony in the church for the church. You're supposed to know it. Don't seal it. Don't, don't, don't hide it. You know, make, make it known. And here he calls the church, he says the bride and the, and the church say come. So go ahead and write this down. God calls us to partner with him. And you notice that the invitation is to, if you have the King James, it'll say, whoever, whosoever will. And all of your Bibles will say, you know, it's, it's whoever will receive this invitation is given. Verse 18, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. And you wanna write a little number four there, this book. Anyone who adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. You want to underline that? Put a little five there. And that would be the plagues we saw from chapter 6 to 18. And if anyone takes away from the words of this, this book, um, so how many of your Bibles say the book of this prophecy? Okay, and then how many of your Bibles will say the prophecy of this book? Something like that. How many of your Bibles say this book? Good, that's a better translation. So if anyone takes away from the words of the prophet, uh, uh, book of this prophecy or um, this book, God will take, anyone write a number six there? God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. And you wanna underline that and you wanna write number seven. Now he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. That's the third time he's told us that, amen, come Lord Jesus. And then the last line is, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all, amen. I've put verse 19 there in your outline from the NIV. It says, if anyone takes away from the words from this book of prophecy, and so that's the seven, you know, you have seven times it says that. So seven times in this chapter, God says, this book, this book. He says, whatever you do, don't seal it up. He says, whatever you do, you know, it's for the churches, and so the point is, and I want you to write this down, God takes this book very seriously, very seriously. So you don't wanna to add to it, you don't wanna take it away, and he says, if you do, I'll add to you the plagues that are written in this book. So how do we take it away? Well, I think the way that this book is taken away is we, we don't even talk about it in, in church. We say things like, well, it all pans out, you know, we win in the end, and uh, that's not a good thing from God's point. So how serious... Does God take it? Well, there in your outline, in chapter 22, 19, it says, 
if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. Does it sound like God takes this very seriously? So the, the book that God takes so seriously is the book that for the most part we never talk about in church and we just kind of brush it off, but he takes it very seriously. So God took the opportunity in this last chapter to drive home the point of how serious he takes this book. Now just for fun, there on your outline, in verse 21 it says, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with all, amen. Uh, If you take the last line of the Old Testament, it says, lest I come and smite the land with a curse, that's the Old Testament, that's how that ends, But the New Testament says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all, amen. So the Old Testament ends with curse, but the New Testament ends with grace. And I love that. Did you find that interesting? And that concludes the book of Revelation. So very quickly, let me just say, we are going to be going into the book of Genesis. We will begin the book of Genesis at the end of the month of May. However, there are a couple of things that I think are vitally important right now. So we're going to take a couple of weeks and peek into the book of Genesis and and see what it says to our current generation. And I think you'll find that absolutely fascinating. And then we'll actually begin officially the book of Genesis at the end of the month. I've had so much fun doing this. Thank you guys for participating. And, and it's, <laughs> him. Yeah. Don't point to me. Don't point to me. Lightning will come out of heaven and strike me dead. And <laughs> we don't want that. All right. Well, let's close in prayer and uh, we'll go from there. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your word, your spirit. Thank you for revealing. And, and Lord, we, we, you know, most of us grew up in a background where we were told that, that not to pay attention to this book, but it's been such a fascinating study. And uh, Lord, we want to be those who heed, now that we've read it, the things that are in this book and recognize that we live in a unique generation and the time really is near and that your words are faithful and true They really will take place. Lord, thank you for this congregation. Thank you for their love for you, the things of you, their love for your Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, that you bless each and every one. You keep us till we meet again. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We love you. We'll see you next time.